from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. People are less happy today than they were 30, 40 years ago. What's interesting about this is that both in the Gallup data and then also in the GSS data, we're seeing a lot of evidence indicating that marriage is either the number one factor in this or, you know, or one of the top factors. This is your host, Scott Bertram. Welcome to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, part of the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. That was Brad Wilcox, author of the new book, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. We'll talk in depth with Brad about his book in just a little bit. Up first, we're joined by Dr. Justin Jackson. He is chairman and professor of English at Hillsdale College and also your teacher for the new Hillsdale College online course, The Exodus Story. Dr. Jackson, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's great to be here, Scott. Happy to have you back. And we'll tell them, tell people right up front if they're interested in the new course. Well, go to hillsdale.edu slash new course, C-O-U-R-S-E, to find out more about the Exodus story, and we're going to talk about that now. You are an English professor teaching about Exodus. How do you think your approach as an English professor would be different from that of a professor of religion? Sure. Uh, I don't know that it's a a difference of discipline. It's probably a difference in my own disposition. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm pretty well trained in theological traditions. Uh, I teach for my diocese, dogmatic theology, but it's my own having that literary bent. I find beautiful, wondrous theological things that just seem to crop up when we actually pay attention to the words in, in the specific details of the text. So I've gone in that direction. I like it very much. Mm-hmm. Um, whenever I teach it during the summer, I always teach a seminar in biblical narrative and poetry for our students here, always very well attended. What I find is, is that the students, at first, they're a little hesitant. It's okay, what's an English prof doing here? Mm -hmm. What's at stake? In some ways, I think the students will step back because they all know kind of my religious background. So I think two things, it's an English prof teaching it. And two, we know his religious background. So which one of the two are we getting here? (laughs) And what they discover very quickly is by looking at these literary aspects, I hope the theological, whatever tradition the student's coming from, I hope the theological issues come to the fore. Mm -hmm. It may irritate them. It may say, oh, your reading of that specific detail is very contrary to my own tradition. Great. The only question I ask is, then what does your own tradition do with those things that we've that we've looked up here? Mm-hmm. And by the way, l- let me say, and I let the students know this, the forefront, some of the literary things that I catch is contrary to my own theological tradition. Then the question becomes, now what do I sure. what, what do I do with it? Yeah. So yeah. If listeners already have read Exodus and are familiar with the book of Exodus, how might a, a literary reading a, as you teach help lead them to new insights. Yeah. uh, um, Look, my approach for this course was very much online with the Genesis course and the David story. It was. In both of those courses, the theology is bare bones. There is a God. There are rules, commandments. You ought to follow them. If you do not, you ought to repent. That basic, that simple. And I continue it with the Exodus story. But in the Exodus story, it may take people aback a little bit because usually we see it against, you know, Yahweh, God, although Hashem is used often, which is in the rabbinic tradition. If Hashem is used, that's the name, that's the name of God of mercy. So it may t- take them aback that if this really is God against the Egyptians, God against the oppressors, then where would there be mercy here that mm-hmm. he ought not show any? That this really is, this is a God just hammering Pharaoh for the sake of hammering Pharaoh to show his power. And by the way, that's certainly part of the story. <laughs> um, I just don't know that it's the entire part of the story. And so the thing where they may be taken aback a little bit is that here in this text where I think we usually get our vision of that God of judgment to separate Israel from others, what I'm trying to highlight is we may be surprised that this may be 
<laughs> the one narrative of the most long-suffering, merciful, compassionate God, both to Israel and to Egypt. Mm-hmm. He, if, if God creates everything, if all the nations are going to return to God, then Egypt clearly has some role in that. And so it interests me to see where in the text are they picking up on it. And again, I hope all your listeners know none of this stuff really is my own ideas. I steal openly from ancient rabbinic and Christian sources on this, on this stuff. So I uh, would that all these ideas were my own. I'm not <laughs> smart enough for that. And so I steal freely from, from other traditions. Dr. Justin Jackson with us, your teacher for the new Hillsdale online course on the Exodus story, hillsdale.edu slash new course for details. Let's give a preview of some of the discussions people will encounter along the way here. How does the book of Exodus help to explain and help to emphasize the central narrative of the Hebrew Bible? Yeah, well, so in these these courses, I I, I really do run with a single paradigm, uh, for good or for ill. But the paradigm that I I want to look at is one of exile and return. Um, you know, you can begin with the casting out of the Garden of Eden. In some ways, that that marks out the entire history of Israel. You've been expelled from the Garden of Eden from paradise. Now, how does one work mm-hmm. with God to get back to that place? So, in exile and return. Um, but we see throughout the history of Israel, my goodness, how many times were they exiled? You have Assyria who conquers them. You have the great exile, which is the Babylonian exile, say around, you know, 586 or something like this. And I'm working from a premise that inspired scripture is trying to take into account that very paradigm of exile and return. If there's an exile, that usually means you've done something wrong and God has allowed you, either God has allowed you to be exiled or or for your own good, or for the good of Israel, God has willed you to be exiled. I won't parse out the difference between those two, but that's, that seems to at least be the case in many of these stories. Well, if he allows you or wills you to be exiled, but the ultimate cosmic plan is for you to be brought back, then we have to ask, well, what are the conditions for this? Mm-hmm. And it seems to me that's where Exodus 34, 6 is so very important with his being long-suffering, compassionate, and merciful, right? I mean, all you have to think about is, you know, I think the the most distilled vision of this is if you look at the book of Jonah in chapter 4, he complains to God. He even says, I knew this was you. I knew you were going to have mercy on the Ninevites, this Assyrian empire. I know that in 50 years, they're going to come and conquer us. And yet you still refuse not to be compassionate, long-suffering, and merciful to them. It's the greatest, for me, distilled version of Exodus 34, 6. And so I I think we have to um, um, be patient when we read mm-hmm. uh, these texts, and to just ask, you know, h- how does this play out? And 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 perhaps, you know, um, um, I I I admit I have a tendency to irritate viewers quite a bit, um, um, but I think it's probably because I need that long suffering person. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, please be that. <laughs> please give me time. Yeah. I'm going to screw up and please, you know, whatever harm comes to me in calling me back, just please keep calling me back. However that means. And so that really does act as kind of a fundamental principle of, of how I read a lot of the Hebrew Bible for us. I want to come back to the topic of mercy and justice in a moment, but as we look at Exodus, can we view it in a way as a character study of, of two men, Pharaoh and, and Moses? Yeah. Uh, I, I, so let me just, I think in some ways you have it in the text itself, Moses versus Pharaoh, but behind Moses is always God. Mm-hmm. Uh, one, of the, one of the lead motifs of the entire book is hand. Um, it's God's strong hand is going to come, but it seems to always be played out through Moses's hands. So there's a real synergy there. So if it is a character study between Moses and Pharaoh, it's also a study between God Mm -hmm. and Pharaoh. I think God using Moses, uh, who's reticent, who doesn't actually want to do it, and he'll still do it. And oh yeah, by the way, Pharaoh, he'll still defeat you. 
his snakes are going to eat your snakes. And not only that, but I mean, God makes it explicit. Moses, you are a God to Aaron, who is your prophet. To Pharaoh. So there's a real hierarchy here. Mm-hmm. So if it is Moses versus Pharaoh, in some ways, I think it's because Moses is a stand-in for God. Sure. If it is about, and I, I think I make it clear in the class, I hope I do, that if we're to understand monotheism at this time, it can't be there is but one God. They all understood there are multiple gods, and these multiple gods do things. In Second Temple Judaism, so after the fall of the Second Temple, again in around 586, there was a belief that there are just multiple gods in the world. It will eventually become that they're the fallen angels. And so I think the best way to understand monotheism in the ancient world is... Um, there's not one God. It's just our God is more powerful than your gods. Your gods will bow down to our God. Mm-hmm. He will defeat them. He created them. He will defeat them. So in, in that way, yeah, is it a Moses versus Pharaoh? Yes. But I think, I think Israel's God supposed to be yeah. there in the background. Let me say this, though. Mm-hmm. For the question you ask, is it really a study in Moses versus Pharaoh? I love it. I'm tempted by it. The oral tradition makes a lot of it. But probably the best place to go to if you're interested in that is that is that wonderful animated movie, The Prince of Egypt, mm-hmm. which really does tease out the Moses and Pharaoh uh, mm. story, that it really is a clash of personalities. Yeah. I don't know that, that, that the text gives everything over in that way. In one way, though, Pharaoh understands Moses is clearly intermediary for God because he has to ask Moses, right. which has to be humiliating. And Pharaoh's, he's just so stupid. <laughs> like, please, this one time I've offended, go ask your God. And it's like, you've done it repeatedly. He thinks he's playing, but he thinks he's playing Moses. He thinks he's playing God, but he's not. It's like, you keep rejecting, like, accept that mercy, accept that you want no more destruction. Let the Israelites go and do what God is at. Every moment seems to me to be a moment of saying, stop and turn back, Pharaoh. Uh, shuv in Hebrew, shuv to turn to shuva to turn and stop and to, and to come back, stop, just quit, accept the loss, accept the grace, right? That generous offer to just go, okay, we mm-hmm. we, we we can relent, just let them go do what they're going to go do, and he won't do it. So in some ways, yes, it's Pharaoh and Moses, um, but God is standing behind all all of that, which is nice if you're Moses, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Talking with Dr. Justin Jackson, your teacher for the new course, The Exodus Story, more at hillsdale.edu slash new course. On this topic of mercy and justice, we see it with the Israelites. Where do we see it with the Egyptians? Yeah, usually people think justice is crushing people who oppose you. And that certainly can be one definition. But I, I, I there's another understanding of justice. And we still have it in word processing. When we say we want to justify a margin, uh-huh. it's to put things right. Um, and, and for me, that sometimes is the easiest, most baseline model of what justice looks like in Scripture. God has created the cosmos. He has a plan for the cosmos. There's an order to the cosmos. Uh, just go back and look at Genesis 1, where everything's very ordered. So what does that mean? Well, that means that there's a certain order to the cosmos, and you're knocking it out of whack. And God's trying to reset it, which would make sense why he has to be merciful, compassionate, long-suffering. Why? Well, because it's best if human beings willfully abide by God's justice. In other words, get yourself in line. So I don't have to. Like, we've seen the flood. Mm -hmm. We've seen Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are things where it's not just retribution. You violated, now I'm getting my vengeance. Rather, it's you've created a world not of justice and righteousness. This is all pretty perverse. And now I have to set it uh, back again, back or right. Well, this is what I see here going on in Exodus, far more even than I see in Genesis. I think it's explicit with God trying to order things. And and I think as, as we go through the 10 plagues, we see a certain logic to how the plagues play out, where you can see God desiring that notion of justice that I'm saying, a cosmic ordering of things, and 
best that we allow for people to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. or, but this is what we're asked to do, I assume, from both a Christian and a Jewish and certainly a Muslim perspective. Write yourself. Get things in order. Put those things together. You know the commandments. Do those things. Can you watch this stuff and then say, oh, that's the order of the cosmos? I should align with that? Exodus, I think, makes it extremely explicit uh, for us there. Moses is reticent to accept his role <laughs> as a mediator between <laughs> God and the Israelites. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't choose me. Yeah. I'm not the guy. Yeah. But then he does. And, and then we see God and Moses speaking, speaking as fe fellow men. Yeah. Why are those conversations important? Yeah, well, I, I, I think it's, the conversations are just fantastic. So uh, on the one hand, we have to be careful when we see God put an anthropomorphic light and he's arguing with Moses. It's one of my favorite passages in scripture when they're arguing over whose people is it. Mm -hmm. God goes to Moses, he goes, the people whom you took out of Egypt— which is the first commandment. Well, look at what they're doing. God throws it in Moses's lap and <laughs> Moses goes, uh, Lord, the people you took out of Egypt. So if you're a prophet, a Navi, it means one who speaks uh, with God face, uh, to God face to face. And it's a difficult position because on behalf of God, you have to go to the people. And God never tells prophets, ever tells prophets, hey, can you go to Israel and tell them, hey, what you're doing with the widows and orphans is magnificent. I love it. It's great what you're doing with them. Never happens. If you're a prophet, you have to go and tell them, um, we need to reorder ourselves mm -hmm. or God's justice is coming. If we don't reorder it, he's long suffering and patient, but he will reorder this for us. Okay. So on behalf of God, you go to the people and that, this is why they all get stoned and sawn and, uh, you know, cut in two and everything like that. But then it's even worse because then on behalf of the people, you have to go to God. Well, that's tough because this is, uh, this is, the, the people are never doing what they ought to be doing. Uh -huh. So then you have to appeal on behalf of them, asking God, just, just a little more long suffering, please. So the face to face interaction isn't really about God. I, I take it as God always teaching Moses and therefore teaching Israel, teaching the church what God desires. I think God is kind of staging for Moses. Whatever Moses wants to do to back away from the people, God won't let it happen. Mm -hmm. God, I think, oversteps so that Moses oversteps and says, no, you can't actually do this. These are your people. What, you brought them out of Egypt just so you'll destroy them? We're going to look like buffoons. What sort of God does this? Like, this is against your majesty yeah. because we understand Exodus 34, 6. This is your key characteristic. You can't go against this. And so I love the interaction between the two of them in it. The, uh, uh, God and Moses' closeness gets picked up a lot in the Jewish uh, oral tradition and what's known as Midrash, mm -hmm. stories that are told. And they're just wonderful stories of God and Moses continually speaking uh, to one. There's just a closeness there. There's a real intimacy between, uh, between the two of them. Uh, Dr. Justin Jackson teaching the Exodus story at hillsdale.edu slash new course. This is the third in this series you've done. For this one particularly, perhaps, what do you hope people say after taking these eight classes? What reaction do you want to evoke? Here's what I hope they get out of it. In, in the the emails that make me happiest are the ones that are something along the lines of, I never read that detail before. I never saw that explanation. And it plugs in perfectly with my own theological understanding, which is a way of saying, uh, because it's a quote unquote literary approach, that does not mean one checks one's theological baggage at the door. Uh -huh. I wouldn't even know how to do that. If I see... If I see somebody teaching something that is, you know, uh, theologically odd to me, but I'm looking at their focus on that word or the cultural context or in, and it holds some water and it's like, oh, they're right in particular, I'm going to have to stop and r really take a look at oh, where's my theological baggage here. I find that to be incredibly enlightening. Hmm. So... R rather than having viewers think, 
check your theological baggage at the door. My attitude is the exact opposite. It's what I teach with the students always is don't check it at the door. Take it with you. You, you should be whatever details that we're running through here. You should be running them all through your own theological filter. Cause what I know happens again, as someone who teaches dogmatic theology, <laughs> I know what happens. We have our theology first and then we filter or just completely avoid or ignore those details that maybe push against mm -hmm. certain things for us. So for me, it is a very a liberating approach here, not to say do away with your theological tradition, but rather challenge it. Mm. Challenge it not because I'm giving you any theology, because I'm not. I mean, other than one I hope we can all agree on. Sure. There is a God. There are commandments. Repent. I hope everyone can agree on those grounds. Rather, it's, okay, you've never noticed that detail before. You've never noticed this pattern. Now what do you do with it? Through your own theological lens. And, and, and I find myself challenged on those uh, mm -hmm. uh, quite often. Dr. Justin Jackson, chairman and professor of English here at Hillsdale College. Join him for much more in the new online course, The Exodus Story, at hillsdale.edu slash new course, C-O-U-R-S-E, hillsdale.edu slash new course. Dr. Jackson, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Great being here, Scott. Thank you. Up next, Brad Wilcox joins us. His new book, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hello, this is Kyle Mernon, Director of Online Learning here at Hillsdale College, and I'm excited to announce that we've brought Hillsdale's popular free online courses to the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. And our next course is The Real American Founding, which is taught by Hillsdale professors David Azrad and Thomas West. After completing this course, you'll understand the political theory of the American founding, and you'll see how and why we've departed so far from the American founding today. This Hillsdale College online course podcast is hosted by me, and my colleague Juan Davalos, and it looks to expand Hillsdale's mission to provide all who wish to learn the education necessary to preserve the civil and religious liberties of America. And we want you to be a part of it at podcast.hillsdale.edu. Subscribe now to the Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast to hear new episodes every week with additional commentary and insights from our team. Go to podcast.hillsdale.edu to learn more. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu for older episodes of this program plus all Hillsdale College audio. We're joined by Brad Wilcox. He is Professor of Sociology and Director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia, Fellow at the Institute for Family Studies and also non-residential senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. His new book is out, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. Brad, thanks for joining us. It's great to be with you here today, Scott. Uh, it's not too tough of a task, right? Just save civilization. No big deal. <laughs> <laughs> a small task for us. Yeah. As we begin, how would you describe or at least start us off by describing your take uh, on the state of marriage in America today, where would you see some of the major trends over the past 50 years or so? Well, I think when it comes to the state of our unions, there's kind of good news and bad news to report. So I'll give the good news first, and then I'll hit the bad news. The, <clears throat> the good news is that what we see in America is the divorce is down since 1980. And so most marriages will go the distance. This whole idea that one in two marriages would end in divorce, Scott, is no longer true. And it's also the case, partly because of that, that we're seeing the share of kids being raised in intact married households in the U.S. tick up since 2012. So now less than one in two kids will 
you know, be raised outside of an intact family. So I, I think from the perspective of sort of the stability of marriage and the family context for our kids, that's good news. Now, the the bad news is kind of like the flip side of the coin here, because the bad news is marriage is in retreat. Fertility is in retreat. Dating is in retreat. I talk about this as the closing of the American heart for adults. And what that means then is that marriage and childbearing have just become a lot more selective, Scott, in recent years, more the the province of the educated and the affluent, as a lot of folks realize, but also the province of the religious and the conservative. So that just means, among other things, that those folks are going to be more stably married, their kids are going to benefit. But we're just seeing a wide swath of American adults, especially poor working class adults and secular and progressive young adults as well, I think, are going to be either locked out of marriage and family life or um, voluntarily choosing not to put a ring on it in in the coming years. In the book, you do highlight four groups where marriage is still strong. Asian Americans, conservatives, the faithful, and the strivers. Did you find a, a common thread among those groups that causes them to perhaps revere the institution of marriage more than than other groups? Yeah, so what I see with these four groups, and obviously there, there are important differences for them, um, but I think in general what I'm seeing with these four groups is a story about cash and a story about culture. So married Americans today, Americans who are stably married, reasonably happy married, tend to have a steady stream of cash coming in and more likely to have shared assets, like you know, they own a home together or they've got shared retirement you know, assets and these things tend to stabilize their union financially. Also on the cash flow, what's fascinating about some new research that's been done is it shows that when a wife loses her job, no effect on marital stability, no increased risk in divorce. But when the husband loses his job, his risk of divorce, their risk of divorce increases by 33%. So it's still the case even today, Scott, that kind of having a husband who's stably employed is a major factor, major force in American life. And those four groups are more likely to have stably employed men in in the mix by and large. There's also a cultural story here. And so a lot of Americans who are kind of writing, I mean, media types, academics, they focused a good bit on the marriage divide in terms of class, but not in terms of culture. And so we see that religious Americans, a majority of them are married in the 18 to 55 bracket, but only a minority of secular Americans are. A majority of conservative Americans in that 18 to 55 bracket are married, but only a minority of liberals are. A majority of white and Asian Americans in that 1855 bracket are married, but only a minority of black and Hispanic Americans are married. So that just kind of tells us that there is a cultural story here playing out as well. And things like importance of commitment, the importance of connecting marriage to children, the importance of uh, recognizing the value even of fidelity now. Uh-huh. These are all things that tend to get more resonance often with Asian Americans, religious Americans, and conservative Americans, which is in part why they're more likely to be married today compared to their fellow Americans. Brad Wilcox is with us. His new book is Get Married. I, I guess we should ask why we should care. What, what is it about the institution of marriage? What does it mean to us as a society that we should be concerned if the institution of marriage is in trouble these days. Great question. Literally uh, this afternoon, I just got a, yet another study from Gallup, and it's reporting that Americans' uh, life satisfaction is near record lows. I've done work with the General Social Survey, another key barometer of Americans' happiness. And both of these two different large data sets, you know, tracking thousands of Americans over time, are telling us when it comes to life satisfaction, when it comes to happiness, Things are headed in the wrong direction. People are less happy today than they were, you know, basically 30, 40 years ago. And what's interesting about this is that both in the Gallup data and then also in the GSS data, we're seeing a lot of evidence indicating that marriage is either the number one factor in this or, you know, or one of the top factors. So there's a recent study from Chicago, we of Chicago, just across the lake from you guys there in Michigan. Mm-hmm. And this study from Chicago found that when it came to these happiness trends, The number one factor explaining why Americans are less happy today is they're less likely to be uh, to be married. Brad, there are myths surrounding marriage. You try to break some of them in this book, Get Married. One is that marriage is financially harmful for people. Why why is that not the case? What did you find? 
Well, you know, what's striking uh, for me is that when I was finishing up this book, I came across an article from Bloomberg, the financial news service of all things, trending on Twitter. And it said that women who get married and have kids are, you know, not as likely to be rich, basically, was sort of the headline. And, you know, I looked carefully at this article, kind of mystified by the headline, and found that, you know, for some reason, they focused just on women and men, actually, who were single. They actually had no, they had no married women and no married men in the data. Um, so I don't know how they came to that, you know, that headline, but it's false. What we see actually in the data is that women who are married are much better off financially in terms of income and assets and things like that. So for instance, as they're hitting their 50s, getting closer to retirement, married women who are stably married have about 10 times the assets the median woman does compared to her female peer who is never married. So there's just no question that the path of prosperity runs not away from marriage and family for women and men, but towards it in, in the data that I've looked at. Something else you address in Get Married is what you call the soul mate myth. Why use that phrase and why do you say feelings are a fragile foundation for a healthy relationship? So I've got a piece that's just come out in the Wall Street Journal on the soulmate myth. It kind of basically unpacks this. And the idea, right, is that there's so much media out there. There's songs, there's TV shows, there's movies, there's romance novels that kind of tell us that love is a feeling. It's about kind of this intense, emotional, romantic, erotic connection to someone else that we kind of fit perfectly hand in glove with someone else that relationships are kind of frictionless, that you can expect to be, you know, fulfilled, happy most of the time, or even almost all the time when you're in this sort of soulmate kind of relationship. Um, and then, hey, if you know what, if if you're not kind of feeling it, you know, you're free to kind of move on, get divorced and, and find a new partner. And probably the best, I think, articulation of this sort of thinking or this way of approaching love is in Eat, Pray, Love, that very popular book by Elizabeth Gilbert, and I talk about it in my book. Um, the problem, though, with this approach is it doesn't kind of, I think, appreciate human nature. And that is that, you know, kind of that intense romantic connection as a physiological basis early on in a romantic relationship, early on in a marriage. And that over time, these chemical connections and ties tend to dissipate a bit. And so for people who kind of have a more realistic view about marriage and what I call a family first model of marriage, where they recognize it's about romance, yes, but also it's about the kids, it's about the cash, it's about the kin, it's about a commitment you've made with someone else to sort of, you know, basically will the good of the other, your spouse and any kids you might have. People have kind of this more family first model, Scott, are more likely to be obviously steering clear of divorce court uh, by our polling, but also I think interestingly enough, more likely to be happy hmm. in their marriages. That's Brad Wilcox. His book is Get Married. I want to find out next about why those family first Americans are so happy. First, what might make you happy is a free lifetime subscription to Imprimus. Imprimus is Hillsdale's Digest of Liberty. It's so important these days. Imprimus looks at the issues of the day from a constitutional perspective, reminding citizens always of our great heritage of liberty. For more than 50 years, Imprimus has featured speeches from the smartest conservative thinkers and writers at Hillsdale events. These days, you can see people like Molly Hemingway, Andy Puzder, and Chris Rufo in the pages of Imprimus. More than 6.4 million American households and businesses receive Imprimus now absolutely free, and I urge you to sign up for it today at no charge whatsoever. To get your free lifetime subscription and be just a little happier, head to hillsdale.edu slash lifetime right now. That's hillsdale.edu slash lifetime and get your free lifetime subscription to Imprimus. Talking with Brad Wilcox, his book is Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. Brad, you were telling us about the family-first model that some Americans follow. Why are those people happier? What is it about that structure that gives them joy? We explain that by thinking about kind of what's been called the paradox of happiness, which extends to marriage. That is, if you're kind of directly pursuing happiness, it's kind of like the, the mirage at the edge of the desert huh. horizon. You kind of keep, you're trying to get closer to it, but it just keeps going farther and farther away. It's something that's to be realized indirectly. And by contrast, I, I think when husbands and wives are trying to be good spouses and good parents, 
they're more likely to elicit the attention and the affection and even ardor of their of their spouse rather than kind of having this more um, shallow, romantically driven approach to uh, to married love. The title of the book, Brad, is is Get Married. I wonder if and have children is implied. Is it not there intentionally? So, um, I mean, I was if I if I had held kind of all the words in the world for a book title, I probably would have said "Get and Stay Married." Um, <laughs> but you know, but this was obviously a more succinct title. No, I think seriously, part of the story is about kids. Yeah, so I focus a lot of my empirical research and thinking in the book on married couples with children. And that's because one of the core purposes from a civilizational perspective that marriage advances is securing the welfare of kids. And some people think that marriage is just a kind of a Christian thing or a white Western conservative thing. And of course, that's a very naive you know, take because we see marriage in most major civilizations across the globe, from China to Nigeria to Egypt to India, just to give obviously a couple of examples that are non-Western. So marriage is a human institution. And yeah, part of it, the story about marriage tends to bind both parents, particularly dads, to their kids, and that's to the benefit of the children and to the larger family and, of course, uh, the community and even the nation as well. It is not necessarily a problem we have here at Hillsdale because it turns out many of our seniors who are about to graduate or have graduated are marrying relatively young, but we know that's not the case everywhere. When your research looks at the, the young Americans who are pushing off marriage or not getting married at all, where do we see the biggest hurdles or impediments to them saying, this is something that is possible, this is something I want to do sometime in my early 20s, perhaps? So I think there are a couple of problems facing on adults today when it comes to marriage. One is that they're not prioritizing it, you know, and Hillsdale would be an exception, obviously. But what we see is a lot of young adults are really prioritizing what I call the Midas mindset, Mm -hmm. where it's about education, money, and especially work. And they're just thinking that they're going to reach, you know, their late twenties, or early thirties. They're just going to magically look around and find someone to marry at that point. And often they end up today being surprised um, that it's harder to find a spouse than they realized at that point in their lives. A second dynamic playing out is that there is also a fair bit of people, especially I think younger men who are kind of floundering in our culture, spending a lot of time on screens, not really focused on kind of getting their lives together. And then that, of course, affects their attractiveness as spouses. So that's, you know, what I call electronic opiates are also, I think, a factor that's driving down particularly men's marriage ability. And then when it comes to screens as well, social media, I think, has done a number, particularly on younger women um, who are more anxious and depressed and I think also more skeptical about the opposite sex because they're getting a lot of negative messaging online about, you know, their male peers. Mm -hmm. Um, So, and then of course, the final piece to mention is that there's also a growing ideological divide where conservative guys are sort of turning to the right and women are often turning to the left. And that just makes it harder for them to kind of, you know, find common ground. And I talked to a number of women, for instance, who mentioned that they had been dating someone, found out they supported Trump, and that was sort of a deal breaker for them. So it's just an example of how this can, this political divide can um, make things even more difficult today. Again, part of the title of Get Married by Brad Wilcox is Why Americans Must Defy the Elites. What about our political class or the elites? How have they contributed to these problems? Are they telling us this is something that we should not aspire to. Yeah. So I give a lot of examples in the book of journalists, writers, um, something, something about Brooklyn, especially, I mean, I just can't, I mean, I can, I can't even count the number of articles that have been written by writers and journalists from Brooklyn, you know, in the last four years that have been dinging marriage and motherhood, especially something, but unfortunately they have an outsized cultural influence on our our family conversation. So that's part of the story, but also we're seeing, I think school superintendents are steering clear of of this whole issue. Even marketing advertising for mainstream corporations now often takes kind of a, you know, I, I talk about a a beer advertisement that sort of implicitly anti-marriage as well Mm -hmm. in in the book. Um, So there's just a lot of of kind of elites just sort of talking left, um, even even as they often in their own private lives walk right when it comes to family issues that I think um, culturally is is problematic. And then I talked to you about Congress and just the way in which a lot of policies haven't really been 
pursued with an eye towards marriage. And one example is a lot of our welfare programs now, like the um, Medicaid, you know, healthcare insurance for lower income families ends up penalizing marriage Mm -hmm. in ways that make it harder for working class families to both get married and get healthcare coverage for mom and, and the kids. Let me ask more on that in terms of public policy that perhaps could influence activity. A lot of talk about the child tax credit, a lot of talk about child care costs, and if government in some way should be responsible or participating in, in those sort of payments. Are, are there public policy initiatives, and either of those two, others that we should pursue in order to provide incentives for marriage? Yeah, so I talk, you know, a lot of critics of sort of um, the notion that we can help on the family policy front would say, well, nothing can be done to strengthen marriage or family life in America. And then I ask them, what's the largest federal agency in America? And Scott, let me just ask that question to you. Do you know what the largest federal agency in America is? Oh, goodness. Um, Health and Human Services. I, I don't know. Close, close, but it's actually the Defense Department, Department of Defense, right? Okay. And so what we see, um, Scott, with the Department of Defense is that for a very long time now, the military has given better benefits to married service members compared to single or cohabiting service members. In fact, cohabiting service members cannot get any benefits in terms of housing and health care. So guess what? <laughs> what you see is that folks who've served in the military are much more likely to have gotten married Huh. including working class Americans and African Americans than their fellow civilian peers who have not served in the military. So it just kind of shows us that when the incentives are aligned with marriage, there's no question from a public policy perspective that we can actually move it on. We just haven't really have had the will to, to move forward. So I would be in favor of a child tax credit that would be aimed at working in middle class families, helping them to you know, address the challenges of paying for um, things as different as food and housing and sports and obviously in some cases uh, private school tuition. And then also I would be in in support of something like a 20% bonus for uh, married families with kids too, to kind of just underline the fact that we as as a republic, as a country, recognize and value marriage and willing to kind of put our money where our mouth is when it comes to making marriage uh, more financially attractive to ordinary Americans who are having children. Brad Wilcox is professor of sociology and director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia, fellow at the Institute for Family Studies and non-residential senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. The new book, Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families and Save Civilization. Brad, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Appreciate it, Scott. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Justin Jackson, your teacher for the Exodus story. Find it at hillsdale.edu slash new course. And Brad Wilcox, his new book, Get Married. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. The assistant producer of the program is Sam Lair. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been... The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.